Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's program. I'm Neve King. I'm the Vice President for Programs and Strategic Content here at the Chicago Council. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to tonight's program and uh, delighted to welcome Samuel Cherub from the International Institute for Strategic Studies and Ambassador John Herbs from the Atlantic Council. They'll be in conversation this evening with the Council's President, Evo Dalder. And thanks very much to the Atlantic Council for partnering with us to develop this program. Please note that Sam's new book, Everyone Loses, The Ukraine Crisis and the Ruinous Contest for Post-Soviet Eurasia, will be available for purchase and signing from the bookseller after the program, right over there. I'd also like to welcome two of our student groups. We're delighted to have the next generation involved in the council at all times. We've got students in from Addison Trail High School and Loyola University. You're very welcome. Uh, a few housekeeping points tonight. We are on the record, and we'll be live streaming it. And you can use social media and your phones. Just please make sure your phones are in silent mode. And this evening, we'll be taking questions both from the stage as well as through our online survey app. The link to the app is currently displayed on the screen there. If you have an internet-enabled device, you can type in chi.cnf.io directly into your browser, and you can see tonight's program, and you can ask a question there. Or um, uh, also, another way, you can tick off the questions that have already been asked to vote for them. As many of you know, for nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement with the world. And the views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. We organize over 200 events a year, and in the coming days and weeks, some of the highlights are later this week, we'll host a program on climate change and global security in a conversation between our own senior fellow Karen Weigert and Stephen Cheney of the American Security Project. On February 15th, we're going to host a lively debate that we're doing with Northwestern University and University of Chicago between Eric Posner and Ian Hurd answering the question, is human rights dead? And then on February 23rd, a very timely topic that we're hosting is about working in tomorrow's world. We'll be talking all about the future of the world of work, automation, the gig economy, with Rick Wartsman from the Drucker Institute, Amy Webb of Future Trends Institute, and a few others. Back to tonight's program, we look forward to a great discussion on the future of U.S.-Russia relations and the brief bios of our speakers. Sam Sharap, as I mentioned, is at IISS. He's a senior fellow for Russia and Eurasia. Um, we also have Ambassador John Herbst, whom I mentioned is at the Atlantic Council, a former ambassador, and Evo Dalder, our president. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming to the Chicago Council. Thank you. Uh, me, thanks very much for, for the kind introduction. Uh, John, Sam, great to have you here. Great to be here. Um, not much to talk about. <laughs> uh, so questions? No. <laughs> Um, let's let's step back for a second, just to start. We'll get to the we'll get to the day to day stuff that's going on. But let's step back and 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 talk about why we are where we are uh, in, in some ways. Uh, so we have some basis to un, uh, to to understand where we're getting at uh, with the U.S. Russian relationship, where it is. It's a little uncertain these days. Um, where does that crisis come from? What is the actual nature of why we are facing the dilemmas and the crisis and the confrontations and the difficulties that we are facing? It is this because of what has happened in recent years, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, because uh, uh, of the differences we've had over a series of issues over the past two and a half years, uh, or is this something deeper? Uh, is this something that really has been building for quite a while? Uh, whether it's been building since sort of the end of the Cold War, or in some ways been building even before that, uh, that this is the kind of confrontation that one would have seen for, uh, uh, for, for a long time, and we're just finding a, a new expression of a relationship that has been uh, in difficulty, whether it's for 25 years or in some ways almost for, for 100 years. John, why don't you? Take that one. Where do you where do you think this is coming uh, th from? This is a mega question, and I'll give you a, an effort at a mega answer. Um, one, this is a, has been long building. It's a result of the fact that at the end of the Cold War, uh, the West had one vision for this area of the world, and that vision was that this area of the world, like states in, in Europe or like the United States, should have the right to choose their form of government, their form of economy the um, orientation they pursued in foreign policy. And uh, in fact, so that's point one. 
on the other side, there wasn't a single Russian view. For simplification's sake, there were two Russian views. Um, one was the view of the Yeltsin government, which kind of liked the idea of developing as a democracy, as a market economy, in partnership with the West. Then there was a second view. You would call it the view of the Russian security services, broadly defined, military, police, KGB, or its successors, the SVR and the FSB, that no, Russia was not just different from the West, but basically antagonistic, that Russia had an imperial right to control all of the territory that it had controlled at the highest extent of its expansion, and they needed to restore their control in some form over this area. Uh, as Yeltsin was president, this, the policy of Russia did not lead to major disputes with the United States on the issue of what would happen with these territories. But it's also true that the policy of frozen conflicts, which is the policy we see in Ukraine, albeit on a grand scale, began right away in 1991. But as long as the West did not fuss about it, Yeltsin let it happen. It was basically being run by the security services. Um, so you had the wars in, in Georgia, in, in south, south of Ossetia and Abkhazia. You had the wars in Transnistria and Moldova. And the West basically let it happen. But when Russia began to play with Ukraine, especially in Crimea in 1995, and Clinton spoke to Yeltsin, the Russians backed off. Okay, Yeltsin departs the scene. His successor is a KGB lieutenant colonel who thought that the worst thing that happened in the 20th century was not the Holocaust, was not the great Russian suffering during World War II, but the fall of the Soviet Union. Very much a member who had this imperial aspect that Russia should control its neighbors. And of course, he had no real interest in democracy. So when he came into power, Russia became stronger economically, largely because of hydrocarbon prices. He pushed a very different policy. He, had, he seems to have firm control of the Russian state. So now the leaders in Russia, as opposed to during the 90s, have a view which says the West is our opponent, if not our enemy, our adversary, certainly. Um, and we must counteract them. And we must push our interests in this gray zone between NATO, the EU on the one side, and Russia on the other. And of course we get to control the policies in Ukraine or Georgia. Otherwise, we'll make their lives miserable. Just uh, uh, for those of you who have these wonderful ringtones, we love it. But if you turn them off, then you can listen to them later uh, on your phone. So that would be, be appreciated. Uh, John, that, so your perspective is it's both long term, but it's really directed from Moscow. Sam, how do you see it? Well, um, let me take a slightly different cut at, that, at the question, which is a mega question. Um, and just recall where we were in the fall of 2013, right before the Ukraine crisis really exploded. Um, the US-Russia relationship was bad. Um, if you recall, that was when uh, Edward Snowden showed up in Moscow. Uh, President Obama canceled a uh, plans for a summit. Um, and you know that was we had hit a brick wall in terms of arms control negotiations after the president had put forth um, in a speech in Berlin the potential for uh, further um, further reductions and uh, so U.S. Russia relations were bad, no question about it. But the tensions at that point were manageable. And what happened in 2014 and why I see 2014 as really a watershed is that since then the tensions have spiraled out of control. Can I push you just before you get there? Why were they bad in 2013? So uh, there were a number of different reasons. Part of it had to do with um, Putin's return to the Kremlin um, for a number of reasons. Uh, Obama and Medvedev had a rapport. Um, that is, Dmitry Medvedev, the, the sort of interregnum period uh, from 2007 to, to uh, to 2011 when um, uh, Medvedev was president. Uh, and they, they were able to accomplish a lot during the reset period. And Putin had a very different approach to relations with the United States. And things got worse also around that time as a result of the fact that his return, or his declaration that he would return, sparked a number of protests. And uh, in any protest, uh, the Kremlin sees the hand of the United States. Popular protests don't just happen. Um, they, they happen for a reason in, uh, in Russian eyes. Um, so there were a number of reasons, uh, but uh, some structural, some uh, more based on agency, but um, we, it was not in a good place. But it was a manageably bad mm -hmm. place. And I think where we've found ourselves since is that things are not manageable. 
that we've seen the level of conflict and uh, uh, contestation in the bilateral relationship really completely spiral out of control uh, since 2014. Um, and a lot of this had to do with you know, Russia's behavior changing pretty dramatically. I mean, we had seen a lot of um, misbehavior in, in the neighborhood, for example. We had never seen territorial uh, annexation or um, really uh, the destabilization of a state like Ukraine, which is just you know, several times larger than any of the other countries that were affected by frozen conflicts. We never saw these kind of close uh, encounters in the skies and on the seas the way we did after 2014. Uh, we never saw a Russian military intervention beyond the former Soviet region and since Afghanistan, uh, as we did in Syria in 2015, or Russian open meddling in a US presidential election. So a lot of things have happened since 2014 that you couldn't imagine happening before it. And I think really the Ukraine crisis explains, you know, is that watershed that does, um, you know, send the relationship into a place where, you know, it really uh, did get out of control. But why, right? So I think there's, 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 there's first the question, why is there a decision by Putin to change the, the pretty a manageable confrontation to one that becomes unmanageable? Uh, what's the, is, there, is, is, is it just Putin who wakes up one day and decides, I've had enough of this? Is there a change in the power balance relationship between the United States and Russia? Is there something that is happening in Ukraine that is provoking yeah. it? Uh, is it all of the above? Is it the weakness of, uh, of, the, of the Obama response or the Western response to this? What leads to what this qualitative change that happened sometime in early, 20, early February, late February 2014, that then escalates in the way that it does? I, th I think you've listed all the reasons. Let me try and put them into a certain order. It starts with the fact that the perception in Moscow, and for that matter in Beijing, partly as a result of the large, the Great Recession, was that the United States had taken a serious turn for the worse and was no longer the unquestionable leading nation in the world. Uh, that explains a lot about what's happening in the South and East China Seas. That's point one. Point two, you had the buildup of tensions going back. Basically, uh, you could say from the start of Putin's uh, presidency back in 2000, or more precisely from the, f from the first Putin-Ukraine crisis, which is during the Orange Revolution. Um, you, you can do a set steady tra track of things he said and did. His his, the Russian hacking of Estonia in the summer of 2007, Putin's presentation at the Munich Security Conference was in February of 2007, you could, you could see it. That's, that's point two. Three, his contempt for Western leaders whom he thought were weak. You had, they thought they, they had the objective fact in their minds that we were weak materially as a result of the economic crisis, but then the thought that they were psychologically weak. And then four, you had the, the immediate cause, which was the kicking out of Yanukovych, or Yanukovych running, after his failed attempt to repress the people of the Maidan with snipers. And so that was the catalyst for, for this great change. But those other three factors help explain how it happened and why it happened. Sam, if you agree with it, um, first, do you agree with that sort of uh, analysis? But if you, if you do agree with it, what could we have done to prevent that turn? Well, I do have a slightly different take. I mean, I, I don't see, I mean, I see much of Russian assertiveness or aggressiveness uh, as driven fundamentally by insecurity and not by a desire to um, uh, test or uh, weaken, um, or as a response to perceived weakness in the West. In fact, you know, if there's, uh, if you ever doubted um, American power, uh, you know, you should go to Moscow because then you'll hear that the United States actually stands behind everything that is happening in the world, and secretly controls, you know, every popular protest and every government that it has any relationship with. Uh, I joke, but that there's some truth to that, and I think it does get to the. Um, the, the fact that there is a perception that, that the U.S. is quite powerful and a significant threat, um, however much we might want to dispute that in Moscow, and uh, that a lot of Russia's actions are driven by uh, that acute sense of insecurity. Now, uh, the immediate cause in 2014 clearly was the fall of Yanukovych and the way it was perceived um, uh, in the context of uh, that same kind of paranoia that I just described as a, 
as a you know, CIA-inspired coup that, that put into power a uh, Western-leaning and uh, in parts, oh, at least among some of the members of the new government, um, although a minority, but nonetheless, uh, from a far-right party that, um, that was uh, sort of openly Russophobic, and this being Russia's most significant foreign policy priority, basically from day one um, in its region, uh, but even more broadly, that is the relationship with Ukraine, um, you know, that I think explains the reaction. Um, but, you know, even if we just uh, think about the, the, the decision to invade uh, a neighbor based on a change of power that doesn't go your way, you know, it demonstrates the extent to which um, Russia had really, in fact, lost influence in Ukraine and felt like it had no levers left. If you are confident about your ability to influence events in neighboring countries, you don't need to invade them. Um, so I think that's sort of, maybe I'd take a slightly different take on that. So that, I mean, I let's get to the bottom of this, because I think this, is, this, is, this gets you to the fundamental point of where U.S. policy needs to go to. On the one hand, if it is an assertive, aggressive nature of, of Russia, then a counterbalance is the right policy. But if that counterbalance is, in fact, what feeds the insecurity that leads to uh, the more aggressive nature, the, the prescription here for U.S. policy is very, very different. So, uh, John, let me give you a, uh, I, don't, I don't think you probably buy Sam's notion of Russian insecurity, or if you do, uh, what does that mean for how the U.S. should have reacted in response to what happened on late February of 2014? I believe it was in his book, Diplomacy, that Henry Kissinger pointed out that Russia was, in fact, as Sam put it, a very insecure power. And that insecurity took it to you know, the, the shores of the Pacific, to Warsaw, to the Black Sea, tried to take it to the Mediterranean. So it may well be, and I've read an awful lot of Russian history, it may well be that the sense of insecurity that resulted from being conquered by the Mongols being conquered by, partly by Napoleon, partly by the great King Charles of Sweden, um, a 500-year struggle with the Ottomans or the Turks before them has bred insecurity. But it's also made uh, a government which defines its security in terms of its neighbor's lack of security. Now, statesmen need to understand psychology, but psychologists are not going to be effective statesmen. The objective fact is that the Russian imperial conception of history and of its neighbors is that they get to write, they have the right to choose their neighbors' basic uh, priorities. They even define sovereignty in such a way that only a few large nations have true sovereignty. And that's a concept which is completely unacceptable to us. So whatever the wellsprings of these aggressive policies, we have to deal with those facts. And our interests require that we stand strong. Otherwise, their insecurities will t take them pulling more and more in our direction, which we don't need and don't want, and it clearly conflicts with our interest in a stable, secure, and prosperous Europe. Before going to where we should be going, just one more, one more piece of history. We've now had... Uh, three years of this crisis. Uh, in the time of that crisis, the basic response has been a set of sanctions uh, escalating through the period of 2014 uh, and a strong embrace by the United States and the European allies of the Ukrainian reform effort. Is that, was that a sufficient response to the the uh, the challenge that was posed by Russia uh, after its annexation. What else could or should we have done, either in the diplomatic side and or on the security side? Sam? Well, there certainly had to be a response for a kind of uh, totally egregious and uh, unlawful action like the territorial annexation of part of a neighbor's territory. I think there's no question about that. Um, so, uh, on the one hand, the uh, sanctions in the sense of a signaling effort that the U.S. takes norm violations seriously and is going to uh, 
uh, under, undertake significant, um, you know, uh, is going to respond to that, that those kind of uh, actions with significant steps was important no matter what you think about the rest of the effectiveness of the policy. But I think it is important to note, with the exception of, uh, of the fact that the sanctions did provide a uh, significant basis of US-EU unity on response to the crisis, which is somewhat rare on Russia policy, so that the sanctions were actually a source that of, um, brought the US and the EU together, um, that they have not achieved the objective of dramatically transforming Russian policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and that Russian policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine has remained relatively consistent from the beginning of the crisis. Um, and you know, in a way, to put it crudely, Russia seems prepared to take its country down in flames in order to achieve its objectives in Ukraine. I mean, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but they, at least to, uh, to absorb significant economic, political, and international costs associated with its policy. Um, so if that is, in fact, the case, and I think we've seen good evidence in the last three years that that, that is true, um, there needs to be some sort of negotiated solution in the end. And I think what, what we've been lacking to a certain extent, for understandable political and other reasons, has been uh, that kind of an effort from the beginning. Um, now, it might not have succeeded, but those kinds of, uh, that kind of um, an attempt to find a more comprehensive solution, I think, ultimately, is going to be what is required if we're going to have stability in Ukraine and in the broader relationship between Russia and the West. We'll get to what such a negotiation might look like, because clearly the current president, one of the possibilities that he's offering is to have that kind of negotiation. And, and I think we need to explore what would a, grand, what would a bargain uh, look like uh, under those circumstances. So I want to get back to that. But uh, just to, to John, in part because I know the answer, uh, <laughs> partly what you're going to give. But uh, what more could we have done on the military, on, on, uh, on the security side, and on the and on the diplomatic side, it, I don't think it's an either or. It's in some ways, it's an uh, uh, it's a possibility of doing not much more or, or a lot more on both. Let me make one point before I answer your question. Um, I was a strong advocate of sanctions. I've been a strong advocate of sanctions since the Russians took Crimea, and I hoped that sanctions might help persuade the, the Russians to change their policy. But I never expected it. Sanctions are worthwhile because they impose an economic cost on Russia which makes Russia weaker, which means Russia will be less able to continue aggression in Ukraine and to pursue aggression elsewhere. So that, that's, the, that's the justification for maintaining sanctions. Now, what else are we doing? Well, a, a far-sighted group of people have been advocating for a couple of years now, if not longer, that we should be providing military assistance to Ukraine, defensive lethal weapons, to increase the cost on the Kremlin, in this case military costs, for its aggression in Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Putin has two serious problems as a result of his aggression in Ukraine. One is the fact that, according to the IMF, the sanctions cost him 1 to 1.5 percent of his GNP in 2015. We don't have the figures yet for 2016. The other is the Russian people don't want Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine. So that's why Mr. Putin hides the fact that the Russian soldiers are fighting there. He buries the dead in, in secret. But of course, he can't keep it a secret. If you gave them weapons, better weapons to defend their territory, not to take back the territory Russia already holds in Ukraine. You increase the cost of, of offensive operations, and you reduce the possibility of offensive operations. You don't remove it, but you reduce the possibility. Final point. Um, there has been a serious but ineffective negotiations on, on uh, this war. That's the Minsk process. Serious, you have Merkel involved, you have Hollande, you have Putin, you have Poroshenko, and others. Comprehensive effort. But it goes nowhere because the negotiations depend upon what's happening on the ground. And thus far, the Kremlin has no reason to change its policy. But and this is really important, and it's not well understood. A year ago, because of the bite of the sanctions, because of the fact they weren't having their way, uh, the senior Russian officials were looking at alternatives for a more reasonable solution to the crisis than their continuing destabilization of Ukraine. You began a back-channel, though not so back-channel, negotiation outside of Minsk between a person close to Putin, a guy named Surkov, and an assistant secretary of state, Tory Newland. Now, of course, I'm not part of the government, but I would get echoes of these conversations and some very interesting ideas which would have permitted Ukraine to restore its territorial integrity in the East and to give Putin a face saver out were discussed. 
Those serious conversations became fruitless May, June of last year, just as a certain someone was emerging as the nominee for one of our political parties. No comment. Okay. <laughs> just, just to add to, because I do think one, I, I'm part of the Herb's cabal on the, uh, on the defense of weapons, uh, if you hadn't figured that out yet, in terms of, of response on, on Ukraine. I do, th which I, so I, I'm with those, we should have responded more forcefully. I also think that the United States made a major mistake in not directly being part of the negotiations with Russia. Uh, and, and I say that for two reasons. One is, in order to have a serious negotiation with the Russians, with all due respect to the Germans and the French, it's not going to work unless the United States is there at the table and providing the heft that is necessary to that. And secondly, uh, something that I think, to our great uh, shame, uh, we have underestimated the impact that what this conflict has done for our nonproliferation commitments and efforts that we uh, worked very hard on back in the early 1990s. As you remember, when the Soviet Union broke up, the nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union were on the territory not only of Russia, but Kazakhstan and Ukraine. And Belarus. Uh, and Belarus. Uh, and we worked first in the Bush administration and then with an accelerated effort in the Clinton administration uh, to convince the now three independent nuclear powers of Belarus, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan to gave, give up the nuclear weapons that were on their territory. In the case of Ukraine, I believe 1,500 nuclear warheads. Um, in return for which we signed with the UK and Russia an important memorandum in 1994 called the Budapest Memorandum, in which the, the three countries, Russia, UK, and the United States, uh, committed themselves to the borders of Ukraine as they were then to observe the territorial and political independence of Ukraine as it was then, uh, to take uh, any violation when it involved nuclear weapons to the Security Council uh, and, uh, and to not provide a security guarantee, but at least to commit to observe these borders. That was violated by one of the signatories uh, when the uh, Crimean annexation happened. And as a result, the United States had a, not a legal obligation, I think it's important, but a moral obligation and a strategic obligation to respond. Our response has never been put in those terms. Uh, by the way, France signed a separate agreement with slightly different language, but you can argue that the French needed to be part of that uh, conversation uh, as well. And for the United Kingdom and the United States not to be part of a diplomatic effort to, to restore the status quo ante was an important, an important lesson uh, that I think the, the, uh, the Obama administration and the Cameron administration uh, can, be, uh, uh, can, be, can be blamed for. So just, I, I do think there is a larger picture here on the diplomatic side and on the military side, uh, as well as, as on, on, the, um, econ uh, on the economic side. Let's move to today. World's changed, uh, as, as John put it, when the prospect of Donald Trump's possible election and now election and inauguration has become real, Trump, like his two immediate predecessors, has come to power arguing that a reset with relationship with Russia is both desirable and possible. Uh, and George Bush came to power making that argument. Barack Obama came to power making that argument. Donald Trump is now coming to power. Uh, so the question for both of you, is this the right time for a reset, given where we are in the relationship? Or if not, what is the nature of the, uh, of the, relation, of the management of the relationship that we should have? Sam. Um, so I don't think the term reset is going to be very helpful in the current context. Uh, <laughs> should should we know, look for a new way to improve relations? No, no, I know what you're that. getting at. I was, I was, uh, was going to move on to that. Um, so, you know, I think the, the, the Obama administration's reset happened in a, in a very different time, under very different circumstances, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we're in a different place today. Um, I think it is pretty clear that uh, we, we're in a, we were and we are in a very bad place in U.S.-Russia relations, um, and that Russia's not going to go anywhere. 
um, regardless of what we may, we may think of its actions. So at, at, you know, in some way, some sort of uh, negotiated improvement in the, in the relationship on any number of discrete issues would seem to be um, desirable. Uh, but you know, I have my doubts as to whether um, uh, this administration has the um, wherewithal, patience, diplomatic uh, skill to, to do it well. Uh, and a lot of the things we've heard so far are pretty discouraging. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is there are a lot of issues where we're going to need to have a discussion with Russia, um, you know, from Syria to broader counterterrorism issues to the kind of nonproliferation issues that Eva was referring to. Uh, and as we've discussed, Ukraine, um, where you know negotiated outcomes would are inevitable and uh, desirable. That having been said, you know the kind of things that have been thrown out there, like preemptively relieving sanctions or uh, somehow looking uh, the other way on any number of things that uh, we shouldn't be looking the other way on, for example. Um, uh, the uh, support for uh, the uh, well, the atrocities committed in Syria, any number of other issues uh, would seems to me um, a mistake. Um, but you know, it is true that we are in a very bad place, and if we are, if there were to be some sort of improvement in the abstract, that would be good. I just have my, uh, I have a lot of questions as to you know how that looks in practice, given the current people who are steering the ship. John. Uh, I don't have a problem with a dialogue with the Kremlin about the most urgent issues where we both have an interest in improvement. I'm thinking especially a dialogue between our militaries to stop these, the Russian flights very close to our warplanes or our ships, which could lead to an accident where people died, which could lead to all sorts of escalations. So that, that's important. Um, we could also discuss ways to deal with ISIS. But we need to understand which are the greatest strategic dangers we face today. And number one on the list, as said by General Mattis, the President's Secretary of Defense, and General Dunford, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is a rogue Kremlin that's conducting a war in Ukraine and would like to overturn the post-Cold War order in Europe. So we need to strengthen NATO, as we are doing, and I'd like to see the Trump administration endorse the decisions taken at the Warsaw and NATO summit last July. Uh, we need to uh, provide greater support for Ukraine, including maintaining sanctions unless the Russian aggression ceases. And from a position of clear strength, we can have a dialogue with the Kremlin about Ukraine. But that's the way you talk to Moscow if you want to achieve um, results. And then we can see if they are interested also in counterterrorism cooperation. Uh, we can talk about Syria. But we need to understand the first danger, and the first danger is to make sure that Putin stops marching in Europe. Is there a deal to be made? Is there, is there some bargain? Is there a set of issues that the Russians would like to get from us, that we would like to get from them, and that we could trade off, whether that is sanctions for resolving the Ukraine issue, whether it's cooperation on ISIS, whether it is um, a pledge not to not to enlarge NATO for the next 10 years. Is there a deal to be had? Sam, if, if, forget about the people who are making the, uh, uh, who are right now uh, in power, or in fact don't. Assume that the Secretary of State is a guy who has negotiated his entire life some of the biggest deals in the world, like maybe at the former head of Exxon, uh, uh, and say that the, his marching orders are is go find the deal. I mean, the guy knows how to negotiate. There's no doubt about that. Is there a deal to be had? So um, it is very impractical uh, to, imagine, uh, to uh, pull off the kind of uh, trade-offs on one set of issues for uh, a trade-off on a completely unrelated set of issues in this day and age. Um, the number of stakeholders involved and the difference between the stakeholders involved in certain issues make it, you know, the sort of one-for-one -one trade is very difficult to imagine. In the case of Ukraine, um, there is no such thing as a bilateral U.S.-Russia deal that fixes the problem. Um, you need to have, first and foremost, the Ukrainians on board, but, uh, and then the EU and the Germans, because they are among the external actors, um, perhaps even more important than the U.S. in, in, the, in the, at least the diplomatic uh, process. 
Um, so you know, uh, it's if if there are to be deals, so to speak, uh, they're going to have to be on specific issues um, and not sort of throwing everything together. And they're going to have to involve the key allies and partners of the United States who are affected by them. John Rex Tillerson comes to you and says, I want to figure out how to get a deal with the Russians. Don't tell me no. How do I do it? I, I agree with Sam that uh, trying to make a trade on Ukraine for Syria is not going to work. Uh, I think and what I'm about to say may not be so controversial in this auditorium if people here are interested principally in Eurasia. But if you were in the Middle East, what I'm about to say might be considered controversial. Uh, I think there's a possible deal to be had on Syria. Um, I've spent part of my time, a lot of my career in the Middle East, so I'm not speaking just from the seat of my pants. Let me I am. Uh, what is most important for Putin is that Assad remains in power. Uh, Assad is a brute, and I may offer no defense of his regime, but we learned in Iraq and we learned in Libya that a dictator, a brutal dictator, is not as bad as chaos in which extremists have sway. And our efforts to support a quote-unquote moderate opposition to Assad have been a complete failure. If we were willing to swallow hard and say we understand that Bashar al-Assad is the legitimate ruler of at least Damascus, for that we are looking for full cooperation going after ISIS and the other jihadi extremists in Syria. Uh, we, we would have to use our mutual efforts to persuade the Sunni Arabs to come along. Um, the Russians would have to use their best efforts to bring the Iranians along. We would both have our hands full with the Turks, but we'd have to have a cutout for the Kurds, because the Kurds have been our one reliable ally in Syria. Maybe this is possible. Maybe this is possible. Very hard in the Middle East context, but certainly from a Russian-American perspective, there's a certain logic to it. And to be fair, we almost got there at the end of the Obama administration. There was a deal that John Kerry and uh, his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, negotiated that didn't come to fruition for a number of reasons. But it looks sort of like this. Um, I, I see more of Lucy and the football in, in the Lavrov-Kerry negotiations. But I understand your point. <laughs> Let me, uh, let me open it up to, uh, uh, to the audience right now. And, and, and for those of you who are electronically inclined, uh, we are uh, taking questions uh, not only for those in the room, but also for those who are watching us on live stream uh, on our uh, uh, conference I.O. platform. Uh, not only can you ask questions, you can vote on questions so that those who rise wow. to the top are more likely to be asked. So I'm going to start with one. Uh, uh, that, that is on the top, uh, which is the following. Isn't three Americans explaining why Russians behave as they do <laughs> the same as the Russians explaining why Americans behave as they or we do? Uh, well, we know that the Russians do that all the time. So the question is, what gives us the right to explain what the Russians are trying to do? Sam, you've just written a book <laughs> on this. Why should we listen to you? Well, uh, you know, having devoted my entire professional life to precisely this endeavor, uh, one would um, uh, at least hope that I have some degree of insight. But you know, I think that uh, it is a good point in the sense that you know we, we do tend to talk about other countries uh, a lot in the U.S. as if we are inside their heads, and there's an extent to which we can never really uh, fully put ourselves there. But um, you know, as someone who is trained as an area studies specialist, I do think that there's some value in, in uh, regional expertise. Um, Maybe that does give me some license to, to pontificate a bit. Uh, people seem to be interested. <laughs> um, I would challenge the premise of your question, Evo. With it's one, somebody else's question. I'm with, just reading it. OK. <laughs> I, I would challenge that premise with um, one name, Alexis de Tocqueville. No hmm. one had a better insight into the Americans than this Frenchman. So someone who's outside of a culture, as long as they are sufficiently perceptive and diligent, can come up with real insights about that culture. And although I think the, the question is fair, and I'm glad that yes. nobody asked the question, why are three white men sitting up here? But that's a, we're working on it. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and, 
forget about the rest uh, that I was going to say. Um, we are actually talking in some ways about American policy. And in order to drive good American policy, you have to try to understand who you're dealing with. Uh, and it is from diplomatic or uh, study of history or uh, from an area and language study and cultural study that you try to understand who you're dealing with in order to inform the policy that you are trying to uh, pursue as, uh, a, a, as Americans. We, it, it, if we were to tell what the Russians were to, should do, that might be a more problematical uh, part of it. Let me open it up to questions. We don't want to just do this electronically. We have people in the room uh, with microphones. I'm going to go in the back right there, just to your, to your right, uh, for the first question. And, and, and please, if you, you, you nicely raised your arm, you are getting the microphone. And if you now can just keep it to a question, that will be good. Do you honestly believe that the few NATO troops in the Baltic states in Poland can stop Putin? I have a very simple answer for that. They are as likely to stop Putin as the few US troops in West Berlin were able to stop the Russians from invading West Berlin for the entire Cold War period. Because it's not about whether you stop them, it's whether you want a war with the United States of America. It's what, uh, what they call deterrence by punishment. Or as uh, uh, Marshal Foch uh, was asked by a German general, how many, ger how many, by a British general, how many Brits do you want on the front line? And they said, one, and I'll make sure he'll be the first one shot. <laughs> <laughs> with that, uh, questions to, uh, again, in the back over there. Thanks. Um, as was uh, mentioned by Ambassador Herbst, the uh, Hydrocarbon prices, the price of oil, had a lot to do with uh, this whole issue. I was struck by how you guys noted that in 2014 the aggressiveness stepped up. How much of what Putin does and Russia will be willing to do is about their economic power based on the price of oil, and why hasn't it or will it come down with a lower price of oil? So um, I think as a general rule in uh, great powers or big, important countries. National security decisions are not ever purely taken on economic grounds. Um, in the United States, if someone you know, walked into the Situation Room in, uh, on September 12th and, and, or in, in the run-up to the, to the invasion of Afghanistan and, and told the Bush administration, you know, this will cost you X amount of billions of dollars, I think they would have been laughed out of the room. Um, there are national security uh, exigencies that demand action at certain points. And what we've seen over the course of the last three years is that Russia is really willing to do things that are totally counter to its uh, economic interests in order to pursue its interests in Ukraine. So um, you know, I think that we should uh, be wary of a purely economic rationale in sort of understanding how Russia behaves. Now, that having been said, of course, uh, the oil price does determine the extent to which Russia has resources to pursue its objectives. So for example, you know, it's, it's as a result of not being able to borrow on international markets, and as a result of the oil price being lower, it's had to drain a significant uh, portion of its international reserves, not completely, but nonetheless. And as a result, you know, there have been cuts in other parts of the budget to sustain the military budget and so on. Uh, so that, that does pose resource constraints, but ultimately I think we've seen that uh, some Russian actions have defied economic logic in, in the last three years, particularly. Another question here from our uh, online panel, uh, which is becoming increasingly popular. What are your concerns regarding Secretary Tillerson's ties with Russia? Do you have any concerns, John? Uh, when he was first named, um, I was a bit concerned. Uh, within a few weeks between his naming and his appearing before the Senate on Foreign Relations, the fact that he said nothing suggesting we needed a strong policy to deal with a revanchist Kremlin pr provoked concern. But once he testified, my concerns were allayed. He said what I thought were very realistic things about the unacceptable behavior of the Kremlin, especially in Ukraine. He even endorsed Evo, um, our position that we should have provided weapons to Ukraine. So I said, right on, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> You're increasingly worried? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you have any concerns? Um, well, Sam? what I would say is that uh, he was doing his job as CEO of Exxon, uh, and his job was to, to deal with, uh, to increase shareholder value, often by dealing with uh, unsavory regimes in, you know, from Equatorial Guinea to Russia. So the fact that he had 
a relationship that uh, bore uh, results for his shareholders it, with um, Rosneft, in the case of the Russian uh, state-controlled oil giant, um, is just, I think, an indication that he was good at what he did. Uh, that doesn't indicate that he's, you know, Putin's puppet as, um, as, uh, to the same extent that it doesn't indicate that he's Equatorial Guinea's puppet. Um, I think, you know, he, he now has a different job, and if he was as capable a CEO as he uh, uh, might be a Secretary of State, you know, uh, I think we'll, um, that could be to the benefit of American diplomacy. Uh, he also had quite an impressive analysis of Russian motives and behavior in his testimony, so I would agree with John um, that it was sort of an impressive performance. Uh, John de Blasio right here. Up front. John, wait for, wait for the microphone, because otherwise she can't be on the live stream, and we would miss <laughs> the, the brilliance of the question <laughs> for posterity's sake. Thank you. So the, the question is related to the last question, and the effectiveness of, this, of the sanctions uh, and also the previous question of is there a deal to be had and the legitimacy, uh, not legitimacy, but back to the effectiveness of, of the sanctions. In the, um, the targeted sanctions have hit a, a group around Putin and uh, the uh, effectiveness of them has been questioned and it, the drive to get a deal in Syria seems to be uh, related to uh, the sanctions. And if you, if you think that um, there's a need to uh, eliminate the sanctions, and we're not for that, and it drives a break between us and our European allies, how could we possibly get to a deal? Um, so I, th I, uh, I think the answer was that the, the, uh, the economic impact is not something that the Russians consider, but it seems to be something that is very, very high on the list because of the way we've structured the sanctions. Um, so there's a little dilemma in the answer. John? Well, you raised many points, and I'll try to address them all in an orderly way. Uh, one, it's true that the sanctions on cronies of Mr. Putin have not been as effective as they might be because they'll use their family members to do things in the West with assets which they can, themselves cannot do. So the sanctions can be strengthened to make them more effective, point one. Point two, those sanctions, while not unimportant, are not nearly as important as the sectoral sanctions on the energy sector and the financial sector. Those sanctions of what led to the drop in the Russian GNP in 2015 that I've referred to. Point three, uh, Yes, the sanctions have not persuaded Russia to back away from its aggression in Ukraine. But there have been times when it has moderated their behavior, and they have tried very um, energetically to get the Europeans to split internally, to get the Europeans to split from the United States, but without any success. And in fact, and this is very interesting, in the wake of recent very weak statements from Washington about perhaps raising sanctions. The Europeans just reaffirmed sanctions, which is really an interesting phenomenon. Next item. Uh, whatever, whatever their impact on Russia's ultimately coming out of Ukraine or not, they make Russia weaker for, for continuing its aggression in Ukraine or doing something nasty elsewhere. So that's why, in my judgment, it's in our interests. Uh, I think that's enough. <laughs> Come here right up front. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned before, uh, how can three Americans understand the Russians? I think you can understand the Russians by the mistakes that the West, including the Americans, have made towards Russia that makes Russia behave a certain way. Uh, after the fall of the um, uh, communist uh, regime, uh, the West ran into the areas that the, uh, the Russians left. Uh, and they even offered uh, Ukraine to become members of NATO and, uh, and the EU. But these are, if you're a Russian, uh, th that's a very threatening uh, behavior. Uh, that's 
something that we can see and we can understand towards them. On the other hand, uh, there's very little you can do as part of the West when uh, you have a country that uh, wants to be a mega power in the world, but they don't have the horses. They really do not have what it takes to be a power. They know that. So they will do whatever uh, trickery they can. They're actual, they have always be, been pretenders. They have never been the real thing. So that's a statement. Sam, you, it's a statement with, uh, with, let me put a question. Don't you agree? Uh, <laughs> Sam, talk, because, you, because you talk a little bit about this in your book, talk about what, particularly in the post-Cold War period, uh, we, we, we may have done either differently in order to, to avoid uh, at least that part of the, uh, of, the, of the deterioration of the relationship. So uh, in a way, you paraphrased uh, to a certain extent uh, the John Mearsheimer thesis, appropriate, I guess, for being in Chicago, about the, about the origins of the Ukraine crisis, essentially that it was a result of uh, Western policies that pushed Russia into a corner, and Russia had, you know, was essentially responding to this uh, this circumstance that it had been deliberately put in, and that ultimately there was a Western intent on bringing Ukraine into NATO, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's some factual issues with that narrative, uh, but that's sort of besides the point. Uh, I think the the argument that we make in the book is that that um, that explanation doesn't. Uh, take into account what was a dynamic interaction between Russian and Western policy over the course of the post-Soviet period. So you can't understand Western policy without seeing it in its sort of di dynamic interaction with Russian policy. Just like you can't abstract, abstractly examine Russia's um, behavior towards its neighbors without understanding it in the context of Western policy. So there is, there was a dynamic game, so to speak, uh, an interaction that um, ultimately produced the outcome that we have today. Uh, I think there's a the um, the issue of blame and mistakes is one that, as an analyst, I, I don't feel quite comfortable engaging in. Uh, but I do think that you know we have to look uh, objectively at the historical record, and uh, there were decisions taken on both sides that led to the the outcome that we have today. I I would just add one small part to it too, which is this argument and this analysis assumes there are only two actors that matter. Actually, it wasn't the United States that moved, or NATO that moved east. It was the east that moved west. That is, the Poles and the Hungarians and the Czechs wanted to be part and had been granted under the 1975 Helsinki Final Act, reaffirmed in the Charter of Paris, signed uh, also by the then Soviet Union. Uh, uh, the right to decide their own alliances without interference of something else. I would and, put that well, as part and of it. And I would add, though, that uh, you know, Russia and the Euro Atlantic institutions had a unhappy but oftentimes functional relationship before uh, 2014. And I think the point here is that you know, we could have had uh, institutional enlargement up to the current membership that it exists today uh, without having the kind of crisis in relations with Russia that we have. Uh, it was the contest in lands in between where there was really no intention of uh, bringing uh, Ukraine in as a full member of either organization um, uh, that sent tension spiraling out of control. So I think we need to look beyond the, um, the current borders of NATO and the EU to really understand how we got to where we are. John, you want to add something? Yeah, I want to go back to one of the questions here, uh, an important one. Uh, I don't remember. One of the two of you mentioned Russian interference in the elections. Uh, um, so a, a really important policy issue for the United States is what should we do on the cybersecurity front, uh, given the evidence that we now have presented by the intelligence community about Russian involvement in, in the US election. This is may not be right now front and center for the administration, but it is one of the big issues that confronts, I think, uh, uh, the United States uh, right now. John, you have views on this? I, I am not a cyber expert, but I understand that in the cyber world, uh, kind of like in the nuclear world, offense is much easier than defense. Uh, it's very clear that the Kremlin is paying offense in our backyard, in our neighborhood, in our country on cyber. The way to get them to stop that is for us to play some offense too. 
Now, uh, I would not recommend we do offense publicly. Um, I would recommend we do some offense privately. I'm sure we have the means to take out various things in Russia or to embarrass certain high officials in ways that do not necessarily publicly point back to us. As a demonstration, the two people can play this game. But I, I think, in fact, to do it now might be a problem. It should have been done immediately, just to make clear that this should stop. OK, go back to the room here. Uh, right here up front. Shane, thanks. Third row. Do you see a potential confrontation in the Arctic area, the way that uh, Russia is obviously preparing to go in and is exploring oil there? And is there going to be a confrontation between U.S., Mar Chinese, Russian interests? Arctic specialists. In the Arctic, do you have any idea? I, I and what would we do if there's... Uh, uh, again, I am not an Arctic expert, but I follow this a, a little bit because I follow Russia. Uh, there's no question that, that Moscow has pursued a very um, assertive policy in the Arctic. It's clear stepping on the interests of, of most of the other Arctic, all the other Arctic powers. It's also true that China's been playing sort of a mini assertive role, a mini me assertive Arctic policy. Given the geography, it makes it even more interesting. Um, which is, you know, uh, I suspect, compared with all the other things on the table, this will not be an area where we wind up in a major crisis. But um, it can't be ruled out. Are there any of the students that uh, have joined us who, uh, who would like to answer a question in the back? Great. I uh, put this online through the online uh, that, forum. That works. We can but, do um, it in both ways. Yeah, but I don't think I have enough votes to get on. <laughs> that's, so. that's why, you, that's you, why you get to answer it now. <laughs> My question is, can an increasingly weak EU and NATO effectively assist the United States in countering Russian aggression? Here's, so I'll, I'll take that first. As a former yes, ambassador to NATO. <laughs> right now, I'm more concerned about an increasingly disengaged United States not helping the EU and NATO to counter Russian aggression. Uh, but the point, the point of your question is an important one, which is the, the, the degree to which the Europeans are, are investing in their defense. And I think there is a, as there always is, a very mixed picture. And it's been a long mixed picture that may come as a surprise to the president, but the United States has been trying to get the Europeans to spend more on defense since 1952, when NATO adopted the so-called Lisbon Force Goals, which were the number of troops that NATO needed to deploy in order to defend NATO territory against uh, a Soviet attack. Uh, and we were, I think at that point, about 94 divisions short. Um, and it's been a problem ever since. Uh, there are, two, there are two aspects to it. One is, are the Europeans spending in, generically enough on defense and particularly on real capabilities that are necessary to provide an effective defense of NATO territory? And the answer is no. Never have, probably never will, uh, but it isn't enough. Second, is what the NATO countries that are doing important to contributing to helping to deter the Russians from possibly attacking NATO territory? Here the answer is yes. In fact, they're doing a lot more than they have done in a very long time. To give you one example, and uh, John talked about the Warsaw NATO decisions. And Warsaw, it was decided that there would be four multinational battalions, battalions about 1,000 troops, forward deployed in three in the Baltics and one in Poland. Three of those battalions are completely and totally manned, staffed uh, by European troops. They are led by, uh, and Canadian. One, by, one is led by Canada, the other one by Germany, and the third one by Britain. But all of them are multinational. There is also a multinational rapid reaction force that is completely uh, uh, provided with European troops. There are European aircraft that are providing the defense of the Baltic airspace. There are European ships in the Baltic uh, seas and in the Black Sea. 
And all of that is sending the signal to Putin to say, whatever you're trying to do in eastern Ukraine or Crimea, don't even think about trying it in the Baltic states or Romania or Poland. And that is what's, in, that's what's important about NATO. So the answer to your question, which is a very good one, is yes, the Europeans need to do more. Uh, but let's not underestimate, one, what they're already doing, and two, the importance of what is being done uh, from a deterrence and a defense measure. Right here up front. Yeah, we want to do all sorts of actions, just, just as you were just talking about, but how is Putin in February 2017 perceiving all this? That's always a question mark. I mean, is it still... A high priority for him. We, we do want to have a so we have they're not so we have Russian sphere of influence in the Baltics and Ukraine, or it'd be nice. Does he believe that the Western world is still weak? Does anyone have any idea how he's perceiving all this? That, obviously, that's always the unknown. Well, I, I don't think it's. There's three American guys going to tell you what yeah, Putin thinks. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, regardless of what Putin himself thinks, I, I think he is broadly representative of the Russian uh, political elite in terms of the priority placed on Ukraine and the centrality of the Ukraine issue for how they see basically everything else in the world. Um, so I, I don't think it has become any less important um, for, uh, I mean, it's less of acute of a problem in that I think they think they've got it more or less under control and they can maintain this sort of simmering conflict and keep Ukraine um, on its heels, destabilized indefinitely, if, if they so chose. But it's it's it is without question a central priority for um, not just Putin, but Putin <laughs> included. Um, uh, I have a so, John, somewhat, go ahead. somewhat different take on that. Uh, one, I think that Putin does represent the view, the Russian imperial view of the security services broadly defined, as we've already discussed. The financial elite in Moscow does not like the Ukraine policies. They don't like the sanctions. Two, I think that Putin does feel comfortable right now because he thinks with Mr. Trump in the White House, he might get sanctions lift without having to change his Ukraine policy. If he knows sanctions are going to last for a long time, his calculation and the calculation of the Russian elite on Ukraine might change. Point three, I think we've seen um, a Russian test of the White House which sadly for us, we passed. Uh, before President Trump spoke with President Putin two Saturdays ago, his spokeswoman, or rather his campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, said that they're reviewing sanctions policy. That was like a little sweetener for the phone call so that they'd have a pleasant phone call. After the phone call, within 24, 36 hours, the Russians greatly increased the violence in eastern Ukraine. To this day, there's been no condemnation of that from the White House. Our UN ambassador, Ambassador Haley, condemned the Russians for this last Thursday, but not from the White House. On Fox News yesterday or the day before, uh, President Trump was asked if he was embarrassed by the fact that escalation went up right after his phone call. He wasn't embarrassed. He even questioned whether the Russians were responsible for this. It's not a surprise that today, Lavrov said he's very pleased with Mr. Putin's Ukraine policy. So Mr. what, Trump's. Mr. Trump's, oh, I said, well, both, actually, as, as it turns out. Thank, 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 thank you for the correction. Uh, this is dangerous. The Russians dialed down the violence now, but they've now seen they can raise up the violence without a, a real hiccup from the White House. That gives them reason to think they could do it again. This is very dangerous. Do you think sanctions will uh, stay in place? in 2017? 70-30, yes. Okay. Do you want to give a guess on that? All sanctions? We're talking about the... the yeah, not the Crimea sanctions will stay in place. Okay, the, the, the July... The, the, the July yeah, okay. Uh, the real sanctions. The big ones, yeah. I'm sorry, you, you said 70-30? Yes. they stay in place? Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I, th I would say it's, it's somewhere in that category, maybe 60-40. But uh, the fact that the Europeans made the statement like today or yesterday is, is a reason why f to think that it's more likely. And I think President Trump will have a serious political problem here uh, if he tries to preemptively raise sanctions as a gift to Putin. 
uh, in that saying, the problems may happen very large in Congress in terms of legislation. So that's another reason why I think you're right to be a little skeptical. Uh, did, you, did you still have a question, the gentleman on the far left? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, uh, R Russia wants to be uh, considered a, a, a major world power, a co-equal with the U.S. And economically, they're no bigger than Italy and in a lot of other things. But um, are they slightly bigger than us because of this bromance with, uh, between Putin and, and, um, and, and Trump? Uh, what, what is, I mean, there's a lot of speculation about the possibility of blackmail or of, of economic interests. What's, what's behind this uh, action and uh, attitude of, of Trump, uh, and why is it a, a gift that keeps giving uh, to, to Russia? So if we knew the answer to that, <laughs> we would all be, uh, I think, a lot clearer in how we would need to pursue the, I mean, it's, it, I, I do think this is the big question, and we just don't know the answer. Uh, it, it, it is, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, uh, uh, President Trump has not hesitated to speak his mind with anybody, about anybody, at any time, friend or foe. But with Putin, it seems to be in a slightly different category. And what that particularly means, I don't know. The gentleman sitting two from you who's very eager to ask a question, <laughs> which is great because we want enthusiastic participants. <laughs> Uh, I believe it's important to mention uh, that Ukraine, uh, Western Ukraine, is very different from Eastern Ukraine. People, people use different languages on uh, both sides, right? The curriculum in schools uh, is different. So the first uh, Orange Revolution proven to be uh, unsuccessful to create democracy, right? It created a dictatorship uh, with uh, Western Ukraine uh, elite, right? Which was uh, damaged by their corruption and... Uh, Austin, um, and the new power came, uh, came uh, to lead Ukraine. So uh, the question is, since the, the country is so different, people are so different within the country, would West ever agree to accept something like Georgia and Abkhazia or Georgia and uh, Northern Ossetia to create a two-state, uh, Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine? And uh, a second question, I guess, Good. Uh, Let's keep it with that, because it's a very important question. Yeah. I'm going to, because uh, we're running out of time, I'm going to ask the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, who represented all of Ukraine, or the United States, to all of Ukraine, That's answering right. that question. Um, I think your perception of the differences between East and West Ukraine might have been somewhat accurate in 1990. I think it's a, a distortion today. There are certainly differences between the East and the West, but in fact, the reason why. Um, Russia's only fighting for a small portion of the Donbass is because the people of the East did not rise against the government in Ukraine the way the Kremlin thought it would. Uh, the real founder of modern Ukrainian patriotism is Vladimir Putin. By his aggression in Ukraine, he's even persuaded not all people in the East, but a clear majority of people in the East, that they do not want to be under Russian control. Um, you're right that the difference, there are differences that remain between East and West, but uh, by and large there's one country of Ukraine with slightly different accents, but not such that would lead to a split of the country. Uh, the, uh, um, yeah, the lady right, on, right there, yeah, thanks. Um, so we've talked tonight, and I would say that kind of each of you have a different view on the impact of kind of the systemic constraints that affect geopolitical actions and the, those that the leaders take. And then on the other hand, there's the impact of the individual and the personality acting within those constraints. Given that if, you know, there, you know, in a series of six months, we could have had you know, three different leaders in the United States, either you know, President Obama before he left office, Donald Trump, or Hillary Clinton representing the future of American policy. How different do you think the crisis that we are feeling now and anticipate in the future would be different based on the personal views and personality of the leaders that we have here? Some IR theory behind yeah, that. Yeah, no, there's a lot. There's a, um, it's man to state and more. I'm always yeah. back in Kenneth Waltz uh, class, but it's a good it's a good question. 
Well, I would, I would just say one thing briefly, which is that um, I think uh, the Russians uh, had a very, uh, were almost apoplectic about their views of the implication of the Clinton presidency. Uh, and we're sort of on a war footing as a result. Um, and that, I think, has changed as a result of the, uh, the outcome of our election uh, and is somewhat different. Now, where that leads in six months, if um, you know, Putin and Trump don't get along, and these are not two men known to take uh, perceived uh, betrayal particularly well. Um, so uh, who, who knows where it'll lead, but I do think that the, the Russian attitudes towards the United States um, are very different as a result of uh, the, the outcome of the election. John? Uh, I would go beyond Kevin Wallach or Ken Walter. Ken Walter to, Walter to Thomas Carlyle and great men in history. Uh, I think that who's president of the United States is very important to determining how security issues get worked and resolved or not resolved um, anywhere around the world, but especially in Europe. Uh, I think that President Obama um, had a relatively weak policy towards Russia. Um, he derided it, and this was, this was actually very, um, this was not smart, as a second-rate regional power. And he still let it march in Ukraine. Uh, I think that we, President Trump's policies we're trying to figure out right now. And we see an erratic type of um, behavior, which is potentially very dangerous. And I think Hillary Clinton would have pursued a very strong policy on Russia and Ukraine that would have led to stability in Europe over time. Uh, well. So I, I, since, uh, since we're coming to the end of time, I'll, I'll conclude that by slightly disagreeing with both of them. I do think that the fundamental driving force of this confrontation is what, Russia, what is driving Russian policy. In the, I agree with, with John that we do have a leadership clique in, in Russia uh, that uh, for both insecurity reasons and for a whole variety of reasons is going to act in a certain way. And how far it gets away with it will have something to do with how we counteract it. But the relationship between the United States and Russia, whether it is Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, is not going to be an easy relationship in which we manage the difference and they will be managed in slightly different ways. But I don't think we're going to see we would have seen a very different outcome after four years of policy of a Clinton presidency with regard to the U.S.-Russia relationship. I think the larger question of Europe is a different issue uh, that I'd keep there. But I do think the systemic part of the, of the confrontation is at least as, as strong as the, as the personality part. Uh, so it, ha it, it, ma it makes a difference on the margin, but not necessarily in the, in the big thing. There are many people who want to ask questions, which is, means that we did our job. We raised a lot of questions here for you. Uh, we answered, hopefully, a lot of them as well. Uh, uh, you can have uh, three people who study Russia closely, uh, who provide different views or different perspectives. You contributed to it. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank John and, and Sam for being with us here today for a, a really what I thought was a terrific discussion. Thanks very much. Books that you can buy.